<sighs> Hi. <laughs> Welcome to my sewing space, or better said, dining room. This week, I really want to finish off this project in front of me. I just couldn't be bothered to think about some content that also wouldn't take too long to edit. I actually had some video ideas, but the editing and filming would have just taken a while. And I'm not willing to invest that this week. I want to finish this off until Obon, which is the 15th of August. Uh, you will see if I am wearing it then. And I also want to put this into video format, of course, so you will get a video about this. I'm sorry, kimono, by the way. And you will see probably the first time on my channel of how to make a kimono from a actual kimono bolt. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, while just sewing some seams finished, I could do a Q&A, which is probably the first real Q&A on my channel ever. It's probably a super boring video, I already do apologize, but I personally do like Q&As from big YouTubers that I really love. So shall we get started? There were actually a few questions about how long I'm living in Japan. The only thing you actually really need to know is probably that I moved to Japan about a decade ago, I think, is probably, that's enough for you to know. I was also asked why I moved to Japan, I came here for a job. So easy, isn't it? <laughs> I wanted to live here because um, I studied Japanese or Japanese studies and I wanted to live in Japan and see how it is when you live and work here. And I actually did not really intend to stay, but I stayed. Another question was, how did I get into translation jobs? Which is very easy. I had an office job that was not only translation but it also contained a lot of translating and later on then i was also um, approached by translation agencies if i would do a translation for them and i said yes and obviously it was fast and good because that's me i'm a really fast translator i think that is how i receive more and more jobs from agencies and now I contracted with them and yeah, make a living with it. So it was basically just connections, how I came into this. I did never study translating or something professionally. But of course, when you learn Japanese in university, you will have to do a lot of translating in the exams too. Hence the speed. <laughs> I, do, I do not really enjoy it, but I like it because I know I'm actually quite good at translating. Also because I have a lot of fun translation work. I also do like um, subtitles and stuff like that. Oh, and I love doing subtitles because you really can change the way those people talk in German you can put it into a proper German especially when it's like something for kids you use a more childish German and when you do something that is more for adolescents you use more the youngsters German like Läuft bei dir and that kind of stuff oh and by the way I'm so bad at it nowadays because I'm not living in Germany it's so hard to pick up all the new trends in language okay next question is also a question I received a lot and it was, how did you get into kimono? And the answer is, I don't really remember because my parents have a mosaic picture of a um, probably geisha. I don't know, it's mosaic so you can't tell 100%. I like that picture. I was not really obsessed with it, but I was kind of curious what was on it. And for a very long time in my life, I thought it's actually Chinese culture. And then later, in life I found out this is actually Japanese and this could be a kimono. And I think like the real start of my kimono journey was my host mother. And she taught me how to wear a kimono and she also taught me how to buy or where to buy secondhand kimono. And that was actually really cool. So she was actually the real start of my kimono journey. And that's already more than seven, 10 years ago. It's a no, it's 10 years ago, I think. Yeah. I knew she was a kimono teacher and she, by the way, could also sew kimono. Like, 
I'm doing right now, just at home, not super professionally, but you, you can sew your size and what you want, that kind of thing, which was really cool. So she was my role model, or still. <laughs> Let's say a tiny bit on the kimono topic, shouldn't we? What part of whole experience do you love the most in learning about kimono and being a professional? When it comes to learning about kimono, I think it's that there are endless topics about kimono and you can, you never learn enough, never. And I also like that every one of my friends who is into kimono, they do have their own, I, let's call it specialties. I have friends who are more into Showa period styling, then I have friends who are more into Taisho period styling, then I have friends like Mami, we did a video together, um, who is super into kimono, uh, obi ties, like she, she just comes up with her own obi knots, like a Godzilla obi knot and like kind of that stuff. In my side it's more like the sewing part of kimono plus the wearing so it actually fits your body kind of style, what is more my specialty and then of course I love Heian period so much. <laughs> I'm probably the only one I know who is so much into Heian period so that's I guess what I really like about it that you have like lots of awesome friends and when you talk to them um, you always learn something new which is also cool. So yeah the, the thing that you always learn something new and that the field is so endless that you have many friends who are doing completely different stuff than you and you still like share the same interest, which is kimono. It's like the most fun about the learning part. Um, about being a professional, and I'm trying not to tear up here <laughs> because this usually makes me super, super emotional. I love when I dress people and after that they say, I feel so pretty or I feel so beautiful or this is the most beautiful I've ever felt in my whole life you very often get comments like that and it makes me so extremely happy because I can relate, honestly. Wait, I'm tearing up. <laughs> no, it's one of the best things that happens when you're a kimono professional, I think. When actually people say, thank you, I've never felt so, felt so pretty and you're kind of like, oh, I know how you feel. That is like the most rewarding and makes everything worth, makes everything worth. We already talked, a, I already talked a tiny bit about Heian period, so. When did you get your obsession with Heian period? I think it was when I watched the anime Kaguya Hime from Ghibli, they released, I don't remember when, and she was wearing Juni Hidoe there. And I just loved the whole movie for how, how it was made and it's very simple but really cute, don't you think? In case you don't know, Kaguya Hime is basically also the um, fairy tale Sailor Moon is based on <laughs> or got its inspiration from. So I can only recommend to check out Kaguya Hime too if you like Sailor Moon and you don't know that. I learned Latin in school for a very long time and I was always obsessed with knowing how people lived in history. And I think, yeah, liking Heian period is again just one of the obsession with how did people live like thousand years ago and have this awesome culture and garments and literature coming up there and what did they eat and it's just like you know it's uh, it really interests me this kind of stuff really interests me so this is where my obsession for him period i think comes from next question and that question was really creative oh my gosh some of your questions were so creative I just have to find it. Give me a second. If you found a magical time machine and you could go back in time in the history of Japan, depending on the kimono style, thank you for that condition, by the way, which period would you choose? You can use the time machine a maximum of three times before it disintegrates. I hope I read that right. Thank you for putting the kimono style thing in because I would not use it at all because I think if people would find me in most time of Japanese history I would be executed like right away especially if I would try to be outside the parts you as a foreigner were allowed to exist also the only persons who were um, in history in Japan were like Portuguese or Spanish and later Dutch people and I do speak neither of those languages 
so I don't think they would be really happy to see me there. We're putting that aside, we're just putting aside that I might get killed if I would use a time machine. <laughs> Three times, you said. Okay, and I need one time to come back probably then, right? Um, I actually would like to go to the end of the Nada period, beginning of Heian period, because we do not really know what Japanese war at that time and i would love to see what they actually were there we do have pictures but those pictures are pictures and sometimes or most of them i think i know are goddesses so you know it's a kind of bit of fiction or like like fantasy in those pictures so we don't know exactly what was worn there we do have an idea how it might have looked like but we don't know exactly and besides that hmm it would be again Heian period. So like my second jump would go to the mid Heian period where the actual Junichtoi evolved. We do not really know a lot about Junichtoi and why and how it exactly evolved, by the way. And I would just love to see some of the garments in between they had until it became its final form. We've seen so many pictures. And also because the form of a Junichtoi changed so often, like the fabrics they used in the beginning they used it was called nae shosoku which means they used very very um soft fabrics which gave, which gave us so super nice and soft look in total and towards the end of the heian period they started to use really stiff fabric they call it koa shosoku um, which gives the junichi doi like the look they have today i also would love to see because you know that I learned how to dress through Doe, which is probably the super modern way, but I would love to know what is like the way they put it on in history. Like what did the maids do when they dressed the empress or, you know, kind of things it's what I really would love to know because we still don't know enough about it. So ham period is definitely a go-to. And then I would really love to go back <laughs> to the modern times because I do enjoy my life here. <laughs> And I would miss my little Franzen so much. <laughs> and my husband, of course, I would miss him too. Okay, this was a lot of kimono and kimono history. So I, am f I have finished off all of these kind of seams. So now I will pin together the kimono. I'm gonna do the center back seam now. I'm gonna pin together the center back seam and I'm gonna... Um, yeah, check in with you in a few seconds. So, start with the center back seam. I'm going to do a French seam so you won't see this super bad stitching hopefully what made you decide to start a channel so i told you i was in the office job and while i was in that job i had a lot of free time or i had some free time um i wasn't too busy in that job honestly i kept complaining about it to my boss by the way but he never changed it so i wrote a blog which you probably also know um i don't now I don't have the time anymore to actually write a blog. And I also wrote like blog entries for like other companies that are running like a travel blog to Japan. And one of those blogs actually asked me if I would do a video of how to wear a kimono or how to put on a yukata. And I said, yes, of course, but the editor who was in charge of me, who's probably not watching, but are we, and we are still friends, left that blog. So I would only have done it for her. And then several other people said, hey, really, you should do a YouTube channel. You know so much about kimono. And I think a lot of people would be interested in learning more about kimono as like the English resources on this are really limited. And I was kind of like, yeah, I could try and to do that. Also because um, I'm a very visual person. 
So I actually like the idea of producing videos. That is what I did. And I had lots of fun with it so far. And I will not give this up. <laughs> Another question was um, how my husband reacted when I started to go YouTube. And honestly, he's super. Su my husband is super supportive in everything what I do. Even when I said I don't, I don't want to work in a company anymore. I want to go freelance. He was a tiny bit scared um, because the income would like be probably. Oh damn it. It would be only like probably half of the income and when I went freelance I didn't actually know how many jobs I would have so he was supportive while being a tiny bit afraid of what the future holds <laughs> so my husband is always like that so even with the YouTube channel I think he was supportive I don't really remember but he was a kind tiny bit afraid of what the future holds as always so there was no reaction I would really um, remember of. I received actually this question twice. I don't know if it was the same person. Are there any kimono or yukata that are gender neutral? <laughs> yes, kids' kimono are heavily gender neutral. They do not differ in if it's a girl's or a boy's kimono. And in history, we do know that kimono was gender neutral for a very long time in history until like women's kimono really hit it off with style, which is really cool. I guess, yeah, when you go to a hotel or in a nice shake ryokan in an onsen town, they have nimaki there that are also basically gender neutral. But honestly, <laughs> I don't know what you actually expect as an answer because even though, yes, those kimono I have all mentioned are or were gender neutral in like the making itself they had different colors and patterns for boys and girls which is not really gender neutral when you go to an onsen and you really want to wear those nemaki when it's a nice 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 hotel oh yeah you can bet you will get a uh, something pinkish or red when you're a girl and your partner when you have a male partner who's coming with you will have something in blue in theory it's super gender neutral. It's actually not. I already find kimono heavily gender neutral when we talk about silhouette and how the garment actually looks. And I do use the words men's and women's kimono because you still have to distinguish between those two because they're a different thing. And gender and fashion is still a big topic that has to be explored a tiny bit better or more and there are also a lot of stuff that has to be that has to change actually but I don't really think that kimono has to do a lot there I think other clothing is way worse so I hope that answers this question even a tiny bit could you tell us more about your work outside YouTube both in kimono styling teaching and translation mm. I don't know what to tell because of COVID a lot of stuff got cancelled. Did interpret for a very, very long time and I would still do it but recently foreigners can come to Japan so there is no need for anyone to interpret German and Japanese. Oh man this thread is so hard to pull through this. I am going crazy. Give me a second. <laughs> Never have this problem so far. Silk thread. But cotton and polyester thread is really annoying to sew with. Oh, my stitches are actually quite small. I'm actually quite happy about that. I did teach German for a very long time um, in a community center, but due to COVID, I stopped doing that, of course. And right now, I'm really busy with all my kimono lessons. So um, I will not start that over again. And even kimono styling, I did a lot of styling for like commercial shoots or sometimes I even did model and style myself like where I had like two chops on the same day and not doing that anymore either because COVID. <laughs> I probably you know that I also had like, um, I had a regular, regular that's Japanese, um, I was a regular on a TV show in uh, Kumamoto for 
four years, I think. That was also fun. <laughs> I did nothing special, I just sat there and said, oh, that's nice. I was just, I commented on things, that's what I earned my money with. But it was a great way to learn how TV is produced and how um, you film things and how a VTR is produced and how a um, good show is hosted and yeah how to talk properly in Japanese there were times when I went home and was crying because I said something that could really end up the wrong way like in a way didn't mean it I never got really roasted for anything I was really lucky yeah that was my jobs before COVID and after COVID we'll see what will happen we will see would you ever do historical kimono cosplay? No, because I don't like wearing costumes. Like as a cosplay costume or a Halloween costume. You will never see doing me cosplaying anything. Have you ever tried on traditional Chinese dresses? No, that is planned when I ever go to China. When I go to somewhere where I have actually friends living, I have really good Chinese friends. Really good Chinese friends. And I would love to stay where they are. I would love to try something on that was traditional in that area because we know there are many, many different people living in China and they have many different cultures in one country. So they have many different traditional dresses. If I go there, I would love to try one or two of those dresses if I could. And if it's not too, of course, disrespectful. Do you ever get any pushback or rude comments about wearing kimono and not being Japanese? No. <laughs> never ever japanese people are like super they love it i have a lot of japanese people who are actually inspired by me i do know a lot of japanese people who started to wear kimono because of me for them it's rather inspiring of course there were some two or three comments online but i don't really bother about it <laughs> bother with that and also don't forget that i never really went viral like neither on instagram nor on youtube so my audience is mostly people who actually are interested in Japanese culture and look for something online and then find me. So they're most likely to be nice people when it comes to being white and wearing kimono. I was never really just put out there um, in front of a broad audience who would probably be a tiny bit mean about it. But I'm a professional kimono teacher. I'm actually learning how to dress Juni Doe. I know what I'm doing. So even if I would receive any of those comments, they wouldn't really bother me. I actually don't want to talk about it, but I'm going to put it in this video. Um, how do you deal with non-Japanese accusations of cultural appropriation? I, by the way, call it CA. I love kimono and I try to wear it whenever possible and I live in the US. So I'm very curious about how others handle it. Thank you so much for your amazing content. Thank you. Two big things I'm doing about it. One. I don't even usually, you never see me talking about CA in any of my videos. I did it once in a live stream and I cut it out. Just when you ignore the topic completely, believe me, it's not gonna pop up. And a second thing is, even if people would come over to me and would be rude to me in my face, which also happened abroad when I wore kimono, I just ignore it. Ignoring is the best thing, I think. And I think most of my friends who are non-Japanese and wear kimono, most of them say the exact same thing. Ignoring it, not talking about it, is like the best thing you could do. I'm sorry this is not really helpful. What do you think about more modernized ways of wearing kimono, like mini skirt versions of kitsuke or people making western clothes out of thrifted kimonos? <laughs> Especially when it's western people doing so. It's not western people who are the bad guys here. It's the old Ch Japanese ladies. You don't know how many kimonos get killed every single day by an old Japanese lady. Westerners are not the problem here, honestly. Um, amongst kimono um, friends in Japan, we all say that when you find a nice kimono that's still likely to wearable, buy it right away because there are many, many old ladies who are gonna cut it up. Like when we talk about antique kimono, there are a lot on the market right now, but there is a day when they will be all sold out and we don't have any antique kimono out there anymore. Don't cut them off, please do not. But besides that, wearing kimono with modern items and modernizing it, I'm absolutely, go for it. I won't, but you can. And I will absolutely cheer you and I will absolutely love it. And I will also give you a like on that picture on your Instagram when you tag me. Go for it. 
Let's change topic. Tell us more about your hedgehog. There was also the question how old my, my how old my hedgehog is. Plansa is two years old. His birthday is obviously in July because I have calculated it down because he was actually adopted in October. So October is my really hedgehog going wild month or me going wild on hedgehog fabrics and everything. We adopted Franz when he was three months old because I, it's not too good to get a hedgehog too soon separated from his mother, which actually speaks for every single pet out there. Um, yeah, besides that, recently we have, um, or we got really nicely used to each other, which takes usually time when you have a smaller animal like rabbits or guinea pigs or something like that. They usually take a, a lot of time to actually trust you. Yeah, we also have a really nice communication style. I know sometimes what he's trying to communicate to me. I really love him so much. <laughs> there was also the question if I ever get another hedgehog. Now, as long as Franz is healthy and happy with us, there won't be another hedgehog in our house. My husband actually wants a second hedgehog and I really don't because it takes just so much patience to get them to like you. And I think he just wants one because he thinks we could do it better a second time. But Franz actually, he climbs my knees and my lap without ju just because he wants to. And he's a huge attention seeker. Like he has his come and play with me moments. And he actually does communicate those moments quite clearly. So I don't think we need a second hedgehog to do a better job because Franza is already awesome enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I just found out that my camera died and my phone when I'm recording my um, voice on is also about to die so I think we're gonna stop here I'm sorry I would have loved to answer way more questions I received so many cool questions so we're definitely probably we're definitely probably gonna do this again <laughs> definitely actually probably I don't know we'll see how many people actually like this video there were also a lot of questions about how to deal with kimono in plus size how to style kimono could you please make a video on nagajupan um, there were also people saying they want to learn more about fabrics and threads I do have a lot of content on my patreon where we have to live workshops every month and that contains already a lot of information you probably want to know make sure to check that out and also those kind of videos are planned they're planned they're coming i swear but please give me time because youtube videos take really a lot of time and especially the editing sometimes very overwhelming and it's really hard to not burn out with this give me time you will get the content when you just stay here if you want to know more and you want to know more really fast check out my patreon so i wish you a wonderful start in the new week and i think i'm gonna talk to you in my next video bye